Okay, welcome to the last session. Uh, the tradition of GCGC is that in addition to the academic paper presentations, we also have a panel on a relevant topic. Now, the topic we have this year uh, and for today is index investing. We've already talked about index investing. Uh, and the common ownership topic was brought up in the previous session. Now, the stylized fact is that index investing has grown. The market share of index investors relative to active funds has grown. Uh, and as a result, we have new things to discuss. One thing is the common ownership. But another very important topic is that index investors, they are not passive, as we already heard, uh, don't have a choice whom they buy. So when the index provider decides that a company is in the index, um, then the index fund has to buy that company. And even if they don't like the governance or whatever of that company, they still have to buy and hold them. And uh, we have put up a little slide here, uh, which is uh, SNAP. Uh, and forgive the pun, they made this topic SNAP uh, because they decided to do the IPO giving shareholders no voting rights, which pushed the envelope for many people just a little bit too far. So the discussion is, what can you do about this? And one idea is that, well, let's talk to the index providers and let's change the rules maybe a little bit. Now, uh, if you go back in time, this had already been done. Uh, index providers decided to um, um, free float weight the index. Now, that penalized implicitly uh, family companies that held a control block with one share, one vote. We didn't discuss that much at the time. Um, but I think SNAP has led us uh, to uh, discuss the issue more. And I'm here to co-moderate this with Stephen Davis, um, whom I've known for 20 years, oh my god. Um, and Stephen, I think you have a few words to say as well, as by way of introduction. Th thank you, Marco. Uh, you'll probably be aware that, in, at least in the governance uh, world, uh, the people that were involved in uh, creating the frameworks around indexes at the index provider companies were not necessarily very often at governance events or even part of the governance world. But today, people like David Blitzer are now rock stars at corporate governance conferences. They're in great demand. And that's only as of uh, a year ago, because as you'll be aware, uh, really index providers did not uh, address governance. In fact, they were painstakingly agnostic uh, when it came to governance issues when framing up uh, the, the indexes. Uh, now, that, that all changed uh, with SNAP, uh, and um, I thought that it was a cheeky slide to put up, but, but, uh, but it did change with, with SNAP. And that was the kind of proximate cause for the change and the reason why we're here today. But there were really other, three other mega trends, and some of them we've talked about earlier today, that uh, also bring us here today. And, and, and uh, you know, one of them, of course, is the, the surge of capital into index funds, and we've talked about that at, at some length. Another is the rise of unequal voting at American uh, listed companies. And I say American because, as we know, this is not a new concept, uh, particularly in emerging markets, but also in Europe. Sweden is a kind of a default uh, to have unequal voting rights. France, because of the Florange law, it's now also more or less default for large companies. But for the United States, it was uh, relatively new. Uh, and when SNAP made its decision, that was, uh, that was a pretty, pretty extreme uh, situation. So we had the surge into index funds. We had the rise of uh, uh, more frequent use of uh, unequal voting. And then the third major mega trend is, and again, we've talked about this a bit, is the rise of stewardship uh, within in investing institutions. And this has been a striking change. Uh, Matthew already uh, told us earlier about how BlackRock is moving to 75 people. Uh, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard in particular have changed in the last really two or three years uh, to really begin to use the tools of stewardship 
um, uh, in, 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 an, in, an, in a, an extraordinary way. And it, it really, w what they have done in effect is moved away from the old model where stewardship, what we call stewardship now, was uh, really a compliance exercise, uh, a cost center for funds which really had, uh, what was meant to keep the lawyers and the regulators happy. It's moved from that into something more linked to uh, value and to risk. And that means that the vote, in particular, is much more important to funds than ever before. And so when we saw the rise of unequal voting, we saw a number of institutions come forward and try to get uh, relief, either through regulation uh, or through listing rules, and failing that, uh, a number of them, but not all of them, turned to the index providers to see if that would be the solution. And I would say that we have found that, for the most part, investors across the board want to see, in general, one share, one vote, but not all of them feel that or have uh, agree on what the right approach is. So uh, there is certainly not agreement, and we'll, we'll hear that in a few minutes, uh, among investors on whether index providers should, in fact, be the source of, of relief. So today we're going to hear from, first of all, our rock star, uh, David, <laughs> David Blitzer, who is uh, ch chair of the index committee at, at S&P. Uh, and maybe, David, you'll talk also about what some of your uh, competitors are also doing in addition to what uh, what s and p uh, Dow Jones is is doing, and then after that we'll hear uh, from uh, Matthew, who, as we've heard already, is vice chair of uh, of BlackRock, and then from uh, Jonas Yola from uh, NBIM, the Norgas Bank, which is uh, um, one of the largest uh, investors in the world with, with a different perspective to uh, to BlackRock. Thank you over to you, David. Sure. Uh, Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I guess I should say thank you for that introduction. I'm not quite sure. Uh, and I'm going to take a few minutes to give you an idea of how all this started and what it is. I uh, mentioned not only S&P, but our couple of competitors and uh, where we stand and so forth. Um, I guess as to who we are at S&P, sort of an introduction, what I do, I, I chair a committee of uh, myself and eight colleagues, and the simple way is we're the people who cho choose the stocks for the S&P 500. And we do that in different levels for all our, all our indices, and that's sort of why it falls to a whole series of committees that oversee them. Where they started, the, the immediate spark was clearly SNAP. I hope that's not an endorsement up there. Uh, was SNAP that had the audacity to tell everybody at the IPO that Yes, we love your money. Trust us, we're not going to let you do anything about it. As a matter of fact, there were some opinions. We don't even have to tell you what we're doing with it. It wasn't clear initially whether they had to file publicly the usual statements with the SEC, although they do. Uh, for index providers, and I think for a lot of investors, it really started two, three years earlier when Google, a company most of us love, some of us hate, I guess, Google, which had uh, shares, one, one vote, one share for all of us, and if you were one of the two or three insiders, you had a slightly different class, you got 10 votes, and despite that, they got very nervous over time. Their whole position was going to be shrunken as they kept issuing stock with one vote a share to make acquisitions. So they very cleverly decided to have a third class with no votes, and that was all fine. Given the size of Google and the size of the transaction or the uh, issuance of the spinoff, which was a few hundred million dollars, uh, the index provider had to sit up and pay attention because we have a gargantuan sized trade. But, and in the background, as I'm sure everybody will mention a number of times, um, this two, two classes of stock and differential voting is nothing new. Uh, most newspapers, that any of us read uh, have this same structure. The New York Times, News Corp, which is now the owner of the Wall Street Journal, which had it beforehand, 
but proving if you're rich enough, you can buy one company, even though it has different, different voting classes and that kind of thing. And probably media going way back and a few other industrial companies. The way the index providers have reacted to it, and I think I should be fair to all of us to say we are continuing to react to it, because certainly for us, this is not, yes, we looked at the issue, we listened to people, we did it, we're done. The issue is still here, and I think it's going to still be here in five years or 10 years or longer, unless legislation suddenly comes along, which doesn't seem very likely. Um, FTSE Russell, which is, includes the Russell indices, which are a large player in the U.S., and FTSE is a large player clearly in the U.K., um, went around, collected opinions from investors, as, as all of us did, and now requires that at least about 5% of the voting shares <coughs> be in the public market. So a company could have 90, 95% of the shares out there with no vote, but if they had 5% of their votes in the market, FTSE Russell would be happy. They also suggested they would start dropping companies from the indices if companies didn't come into compliance with the rules in between three and five years. And the rules are a whole lot more complicated than I've just described, but I think it gives sort of the gist of the idea. Uh, MSCI also sought opinions, or in all three firms have issued public letters asking for responses and posing questions and getting uh, information back. MSCI, I believe, is, is slowly wrapping up the second consultation. They have, on a temporary basis, said that for companies being added to their indices, uh, you can only have one, one share class. And presumably you have one vote per share, but even if it has 10 votes, because all shares are the same, it doesn't make any difference. Both of those did, essentially, every index out there. S&P is a little bit different in the sense that rather than having our indices all built top down, they're really built from the bottom up. Part of it is our history is we've gone around acquiring other people's indices. Uh, Dow Jones is now part of us. Uh, most of our emerging market indices came from the World Bank. A lot of other global industries came, you go through active history from a firm called Solomon Brothers many years ago. And so we looked at this, and we looked at the S&P 500, and incidentally, and I think all three providers have this issue. Each of us publishes literally a few hundred thousand indices around the world, stocks, sometimes bonds, sometimes other things. But in every, in case of every firm, everybody looks just at one or two. You know, if I took a poll here and asked you what indices does S&P publish, I'd hear the 500, I'd hear the Dow, and I don't think I'd hear any third, except from the pros at the table. Um, and maybe not even them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. So what we did was we looked at the 500 and all its existing rules, and we discovered the way the rules worked. If we didn't do anything, we were inviting people to do what Google did. We are inviting them to issue a new class of stock with zero votes and, or, or do it before they're added to the index even better so they could jo jockey things more. And our point of view was, we weren't quite sure of the grand morality of this debate, but we were reasonably sure we didn't want to be way over to one side or way over to the other side. We also wanted a very simple rule, and this may be some, where I differ a little bit from FTSE and MSCI. Um, we tried a lot of numerical rules to figure out how we can handle with different classes of stock, and you have to evaluate each class on its own, and you have different rules for float and all kinds of other complexities. And every time we wrote a rule with all kinds of Greek letters like we saw earlier today, somebody else in the office figured out how to beat it in about 20 minutes. And after two weeks of emails like this, somebody said, look, let's be nice and simple. You can have one class of stock, that's it. If you're going to be added to the S&P 500, and the rule applies to a few other of our indices, any time going forward, or any time after last July 31st, one class of stock, or we're not going to add you. Yes, we're keeping the other ones in there. Simple reason, to throw Facebook and Google out of an index, even an index people didn't pay attention to. Um, well, first of all, we heard about career risk this morning. It would have been very personal. And it uh, would have also been, um, 
you heard about liquidation, that would have been a serious risk. You don't go around doing things like that, because people like BlackRock will have a very legitimate complaint. Why did you just throw 5% of the value of the index and out the door? Um, so what we ended up with is a very simple rule, but it's limited to a few indices in particular. Um, I guess one other comment before we pass on, and that is something I don't think any of us have really thought enough about, uh, certainly the index providers haven't thought enough about, because we, to a small extent this was fighting fires, sort of. But it's really a question of what do we want to accomplish with all this in the long run? Um, I know more people invest in indices today than they did 10 years ago, maybe even 10 months ago. Um, and I know we get a lot of press coverage and everything. But the idea that even dropping a stock to the S&P 500 is going to convince somebody to change their ways, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, we just don't have, you know, if you need this much cloud to do that, we're in the, you know, pinch down. We, we don't have that cloud. It might be nice for our egos if we did, but we can't do that. And I think the same thing is true of MSCI and the same to, to a FTSE. And we all get approached. MSCI will tell you about getting lobbied by China to change the rules about including Chinese stocks in their indices. And it goes on and on. But if we're out to change the rules for all stocks, we're not going to do it. I think we are out to raise the issue a little bit. and make it worthwhile thinking about, but I'm not sure we've really decided exactly where we go from here on this issue, but we're going to have to figure that going forward. Thank you. So uh, let me give you a little bit of uh, history, uh, and also, before I start, introduce my colleague, Michelle Etkins, who snuck in the back uh, over there. Michelle runs our investment stewardship group. Uh, and so all the questions you were saving up for me, you can now address to Michelle uh, and when we all go and have drinks. Michelle will be here uh, tomorrow as well. Um, so as David pointed out, uh, dual class stocks are not new. Uh, they were around, and when I was a practicing lawyer, I confess, I used to uh, do them with, for companies that would, for whom I represented in IPOs uh, often. What, uh, and, and they became increasingly popular, not just in, in tech stocks or media stocks, but in just general offerings uh, through the 70s and into the 80s. Uh, but they were limited to, generally, to uh, a five to one ratio. And the key was the one, that, they, that everybody had a vote, but it was diminished. And it was um, unabashedly for the purpose of giving the founders uh, a long-term control of the company. There was no, nobody was uh, suggesting anything to the contrary. But it also always provided that when the founders transferred the shares, either because of death or because of transfer on their own, those shares reverted to the ones category and they lost their ex excess vote. So that the founders would not get a, a premium upon the transfer of uh, the control of the company, uh, which would be inherent in the vote. Um, that fell into um, some disrepute, but it certainly uh, began to wither away. And, and in the, uh, the 90s, it wasn't a, a popular mechanism at all until Google, as David pointed out, revived it. Uh, and then all the tech companies have followed suit, almost as a matter of course. Um, so we at BlackRock, as I think I told you earlier, uh, we don't avail ourselves of the hundreds of thousands of indices that David uh, creates. We only use about 850, uh, but that's a lot of indices, 850. Uh, but there are 50 of them uh, that constitute 70 or 75 percent of the assets. And the big one, obviously, is the S&P 500. That's the largest one by far. Uh, it, there's nothing that's remotely actually uh, as close to it as... Um, if any of you want to see the indices, uh, that BlackRock uh, has products in or wants to see the AUM related to those indices, go to our website. It's all there, and it's readily available uh, and more or less easy to find. If you have difficulty finding it, call me, and I'll, I'll, I'll guide you through it. But you can find it on the blackrock.com uh, website. So what's our view of, of, uh, of weighted voting? 
uh, what's now, it used to be called, by the way, when I was doing it, weighted voting. It wasn't called dual class. It was called weighted voting, which is interesting because it's actually a more apt and a descriptive term of what it is, of what it really is. Um, but it, it, we believe that voting rights are a crucial and inherent uh, piece of ownership. And as a result, uh, we subscribe strongly to the one share, one vote principle. If you own a share, you should have a vote. Now, I, I tell you parenthetically that in the late 70s or early 80s, one creative investment banker decided that we should offer to companies, should offer to the world a set of securities called unbundled stock units. And what an unbundled stock unit was, separation of the vote into one security, the dividend into another security, the equity claim on uh, liquidation into a third, and the appreciation of capital into a fourth, basically taking the, the attributes of common stock and dividing it up. And the bank, but a vote was one of those, was a, was a key one. Um, they never got issued because the, the accountants at the SEC um, had some rather obstreperous questions to ask about how you would account for these. Uh, but but, the, but the, the notion that a vote has value um, is certainly well known and has been well known for many, many, many years. So we believe one share, one vote. Um, and uh, all shareholders uh, should have that. Now, where does that put us on the issue of uh, what do we think about founders keeping a extra vote uh, in their own hands? We are unsympathetic to them for the long term, but we're understanding in the short term. We can understand why a founder uh, may want to uh, make sure that they can retain control, uh, particularly for companies uh, that are uh, in, the, in the growth stage of their business, uh, where they're not mature yet, uh, where the founders can add some real value, uh, and that would be fine. Uh, but what we would then suggest is that uh, the, found, the companies put up for a vote of all shareholders, the non-voting shareholders or the low-voting shareholders, and let those shareholders determine uh, whether to continue the high vote versus no vote or high vote versus low vote, uh, and do that at some period of time. Uh, we're not, uh, we don't have hard and fast rule, I don't think, uh, Michelle, unless you tell me differently as to what the period of time ought to be, but somewhere between five years, maybe six years. Um, I'm on the more conservative, maybe conservative or liberal, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. I would say four years, uh, but some reasonable period of time. And then um, assuming that they, the founders win that vote, to refresh it every periodic period, every whatever the period is, like in effect say on pay, except that it be binding, not be advisory, be a binding vote. Um, so that's, that's our view of, of the world. Now with respect to whether the index providers, and just so that you all understand, um, S&P Dow Jones creates index indices, which they then license to folks like BlackRock for use in connection with fund products. So every one of our funds that is called an iShares core S&P 500 fund has a license from S&P uh, and pays S&P a licensing fee on an annual basis, uh, which could always be lower. And, uh, and they... Uh, no editorial. And, um, but we don't think that the, um, the privilege of creating indices uh, also brings with it the privilege of determining corporate governance. And, and why do we say that? Um, in a sense, by eliminating dual class or weighted voting securities from any particular index, it doesn't really matter which one, uh, the index providers have lowered or reduced the investable universe for our clients. And the whole purpose of an index, from our point of view, is to have as broad an investable universe as possible within the guidelines of what that index is seeking to replicate. So it's the S&P 500, or if it's a particularly uh, industry-focused index, or whatever it may be. So we don't think the index providers who are, um, in a sense, 
no offense, David, self-appointed uh, should be determining corporate governance. Corporate governance in this country, in the United States, uh, is an amalgam of regulatory uh, rules, basically state law. At, in the first instance, state law. There's obviously lots of regulatory SEC overlay that actually does affect corporate governance, whether they want to admit it or not. And there are other regulations, stock exchange rules and the like. So we think it's the regulator's obligation or it's or properly placed in the hands of regulators uh, to set the governance rules uh, that, it, that American corporations should, should abide by. Um, so that's basically, I think, a fair summary of where the BlackRock view is. Uh, and we certainly welcome, uh, and we get to it, questions and, uh, and commentary. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I think um, I, I'd first like to talk a little bit about how we ended up in the situation we are, and then a little bit about NBIM. BlackRock has had lots of tension today, but uh, we've only been mentioned once, and I'm very happy about that. <laughs> um, and then in the end, to talk a little bit about our position on, the, uh, on voting rights in the indices. I think uh, SNAP is a very good uh, place to start, because SNAP is, a, in a sense, a good uh, expression of how capital markets have changed. Um, we see uh, companies listing later and later. Uh, listing is no longer purely about raising capital. It's more about, uh, what's a polite word for cashing out? It's, uh, we also see... Oh, that's that's the word. That's a technical term. Thank you. So, so, so companies are are, are listing later. They're they're raising cash through other markets. Uh, we see fewer companies getting listed because they're bought up. They're merged with other companies. Um, and when they list, they're in a much stronger position. They often have, uh, and they often. Uh, come with unique technologies, with unique founders, unique insights who are able to or who want to retain that power over the company and the, uh, the IP and their ideas and, and their know-how and protect themselves through uh, unequal voting rights. So I think Snap and other companies like it are an expression of how capital markets have changed. And having fewer IPOs is something that worries investors like ourselves. And, and others, uh, and voting rights, of course, is something that is that is also worrying. We, if you look at, and that's just how the capital markets have changed on the company side. If you look at um, stock exchanges, you will also see that stock exchanges used to be public utilities. Now they're listed companies themselves. They're the way they make money has also changed. IPOs are important, but trading is even more important. Uh, less attention is being paid to investors. We so certainly haven't had any success in persuading uh, stock exchanges to limit or uh, reverse some um, of the worst examples of unequal voting rights. We've met with deaf ears. Um, so, so the role of stock exchanges has changed as well. We see that recently in Asia, where two major stock exchanges have gone from uh, gone or gone into accepting unequal voting rights uh, because they feel that they've lost out to listings, which have instead happened in the U.S., where there are other listing rules. So, the stock so stock exchanges have also changed. We see that uh, investors have also changed. You mentioned that we have. Uh, a growth of index investors, in, investors that have to be invested very broadly, uh, that have to be invested in as many companies as possible. So even though there are companies where, where we may not like the uh, corporate governance or we may not like the, the, the voting structure, we have to be inv invested in those as well. And lastly, we have index providers, which I think have become uh, much more important. So all these, all these elements, all these players in the ecosystem contribute to changing um, the very nature of, of the public markets and our relationship to, to the companies. Why is this important to us? Um, brief history, we, we manage uh, the um, government pension fund on behalf of the Ministry of Finance, and the Ministry of Finance measures us against uh, an index. Actually, we have only two indexes. We have uh, one index for uh, equities, which is the, the FTSE global index, and then the Barclays index for fixed income. So much simpler in our case. Um, 
and we're measured against, we have a tracking error, and that's how the Ministry of Finance measures whether we're doing a good uh, job or not. So everything that's uh, in the index, we have to buy, unless we decide, or the, we have an external council on ethics that excludes certain companies, but there are about 400 companies, so that's on gross human rights violation, but we can look apart from that. That doesn't really touch on voting rights. What is important for us is voting rights are crucial in um, what we call the shareholder approval regime, that shareholders, as the residual claimants on the capital, uh, have a right to approve major decisions by the board and the right to, do, to approve who sits on the board. And we think that's integral to our way of owning. We don't get involved in the management of the company, but we want to have a say on the board because we want to have the best possible board in place, and therefore voting rights are crucial for us. We are, so what is our approach in the case of, of index providers and voting rights? We are pragmatic in the sense that we also believe uh, it is the primary job of standard setters of regulators to provide good corporate governance in companies. But we see that the, just in the last year that all developments are moving in the wrong direction. And we therefore think it's appropriate also to explore uh, options like um, index providers considering voting rights. We, we've seen basically three different ways that index providers are doing that, either by um, excluding new companies with unequal voting rights, like uh, S&P Dow Jones has, uh, has decided to do, or imposing a threshold, uh, like FTSE Russell has done, or the proposal now by, by MSCI to, to weight them. Um, we've considered all these proposals, especially the last one by, by, um, by MSCI, and while we support the, well, 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 we uh, share the concern expressed by MSCI about the current state, about the growth of unequal voting rights. We're also concerned about what indexes are supposed to do. They're supposed to objectively reflect the investable market. And with the proposal that we've seen, we would, in a sense, we would shift the index in a direction, certain direction. They would include more mature companies, it would be more traditional industries. Uh, it would be uh, companies, we would be more invested in companies that have a dispersed uh, passive ownership base. So all these things are, are, are things that on balance we think will be negative for our way of investing and investing broadly in the market. Thank you. Well, I, I guess in part, you know, a reaction to a couple of the comments and, and that kind of uh, that kind of thing. Um, first, I should say, for a lot of the questions, S and P Dow Jones, it, as a business, it really doesn't have a formal point of view or something like that. So, probably most of not all what you hear is where my personal opinion. Uh, my guess is it's shared by my colleagues who sit on the various different index committees and so on, but. You blame me, not them, especially since you know who they are. But the best of all worlds, I would agree that this is a matter of, probably from legislation more than anything else. Um, and that's that. But there is this sort of question of why or how did index providers such as S&P, how do we get involved in this? And we do make an attempt to, to respond to and listen to investors. And investors can vary uh, from BlackRock State Street, Vanguard, which are three of the big ones. Um, all the way down, we'll hear, every once in a while, we'll hear somebody who's calling up and complaining about something in his 401k. Usually there's nothing we can do about it because it may be somebody else's index for that matter. But we, we hear from a whole range. And we certainly heard from a whole range starting, I guess, about two weeks after SNAP, if not two weeks before. So looking at this, I think we've, we started by feeling that um, we couldn't ignore it, we had to do something. And that was really the genesis of it. And in our case, I think we wanted to say somewhat slightly neutral, um, not completely to one side. One of the am amusing out outcomes of all this was in, I guess, three months after SNAP 
went public and we reviewed various things and we run an index of initial public offerings, which I think our competitors do too. And uh, it's largely run by a couple of analysts and it's somewhat mechanical, although it is looked over by a committee. Uh, Snap went into that index just like it should have, just like any other IPO. So while we were out there saying, no, we really don't like this, um, we probably had it in an index faster than almost anybody else as, as a result, and so on. I think the other thing, though, about indices that's important to understand is there are, not only are there numerous of them, but they're really different kinds, and so on. And I think this may come to some of the direction and, and maybe some of the comments that you were making. Um, used to be, you had an index that covered the whole market, and that was it, and you either bet in the whole market or you didn't. And that was the way it all worked. And that's still the way the vast majority of the money is, I think. But increasingly, they're much more specialized. Uh, we have indices that focus only on dividend. We have indices that focus on what are called value stocks, which me usually means they're dirt cheap and we hope they get expensive down the road. That those don't always work, and, and so on. And um, we also have indices for sustainability and environmental quality, and, and the list goes on. But I think down the road, one solution is we may more and more see indices based first on voting and maybe on other concepts and ideas of governance. And you're sitting here as an index provider and learning a whole lot today. I'd like to come with an idea. How can I look at a company and numerically, analytically, maybe in Greek letters, have a way to tell me whether that was good corporate governance or not? I don't know if people buy the index, and I don't know about the performance, but that's in the future, and I think voting is someplace there. So one way this may unfold is going to be more specialized indices, and um, when this happens, you all come back and claim we're just replacing all those activist investors and all those active managers, which is probably largely true over the last 10 years. So uh, why do we do investment stewardship? We, we, we do it because we believe that uh, we have a fiduciary duty to our clients to try to improve over time the long-term investment that they make and that is, that is inherent in buying an index fund particularly, but even on the active side similarly too. More than two-thirds of our clients are the same types of people that Norges Bank Deal represents, which is to say, pensioners or people saving for retirement. This is all; these are all basically retirement investments, and so uh, so that's why we talk about the long term, and we think that long term values will be enhanced uh, by good corporate governance. However, that's defined, Jeffrey, but by good corporate governance, and in order to do that, uh, we need to be able to talk to. The, the population of corporations that we think are not exhibiting good corporate governance. And interestingly, I think I'm right, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, those companies, many companies where we don't have a vote or we have a very diminished vote as a result of dual class or weighted voting are frankly quite arrogant and refuse or decline or minimize the, uh, the talking to us notwithstanding that our clients own a large amount of the company from an economic point of view. So it's not just the vote, it's also the voice. And by, by, dis, by dividing and disassociating vote and voice, uh, we believe you actually are uh, adversely affecting the influence we can have and we try to have uh, on behalf of all shareholders. Uh, secondly, we think that Unfortunately, um, as uh, Jonas has pointed out, the stock exchanges are engaged in a race to the bottom. They're not engaged in, as you would think, they would be a bulwark of, of corporate governance in terms of, of vote, but they're not, as it turns out, around the world. Uh, so uh, it's hard to find an appropriate body that will actually react. Um, it may well be that it ought to be legislative, uh, but you've got to have a a fairly high opinion of, uh, of the legislatures to think that that's going to happen uh, or happen in the near term. So this is a serious problem. And finally, um, there is research, and some of it is conducted by Lucian, 
because you had an article last year, which suggests that over time, pick your time period, whether it's five years or whatever, um, dual class stocks actually begin to decline in value in part because at least, I, if I'm quoting you incorrectly, tell me, in part at least because of the dual class nature uh, of the companies. And so that it actually becomes an economic detriment to, uh, to the shareholders, even if it didn't start out that way. Yeah, so uh, let's, uh, we'll ask a question each and then we open it to the floor. Jeff is already raising his hand. Oh, Jeff goes first. Okay. <laughs> Can I have a question? Can you share? Uh, Matt, um, what do you do about the four stocks that are listed in the Dow Jones Industrial Average? Because they're the ones that are listed in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Oh, the reason not, not to, uh, 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 the index concern is that uh, it minimizes the extent to which uh, uh, the founder internalizes whatever might be the negative governance costs of the dual class structure. Um, because precisely because the firm is in uh, the S&P, everybody, at, all of those who follow that have to buy the stock and so it artificially inflates demand, if you want to put it that way, for a stock that were not getting the benefit of the forced buyers might be coming in at a lower price and that would have, that would force internalization of the governance arrangements among the, the VCs, the founder, et cetera, and so might affect the decision as to the, the governance set up in the first instance. That was, um, you know, that's kind of the classic case as to why there ought to be the freedom in an IPO is to set, to set alternative terms is precisely because the seller of the shares is going to internalize the costs. But again, the index raises this, this forced buyer issue, and I wonder what, what you think, think about that. But, but that's, that's an issue, you can answer in a second, but that's an issue that affects any company that goes into the index. That's not a dual class uh, weighted voting issue. It's, an in, it's, a, it's a problem of going in the index, uh, and that's a consequence of having indices. Uh, I think. I don't think it's the it's particularly well on, on the voting side. But David? Well, yes. It, <clears throat> first of all, most of the high, very prominent indices like the 500 don't take IPOs in because of all kinds of technical issues. For the 500, company has to trade for a year before we'll con it's being considered for the index. But putting a company in a high profile index, yes, we're, we're guaranteeing a certain number of shareholders in some sense. We're also guaranteeing the company has a certain stable shareholder base because most of the shareholders are going to hang around in that position unless the company has dropped from whatever the index is. But at the same time, there are pluses and minuses. The stock probably goes up a little bit, but the most studies show it gives it back. It's going to raise the profile of the stock. It's probably going to get the more analysts on the street who may or may not like it. And... Uh, it's just going to raise the profile. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. And, um, but there is that small forced element. But in the extreme, somebody will come along and build a new index, or some of those shareholders will go elsewhere. Yeah, Jeff, you, I, 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 I maybe answered your question too cavalierly. It, it's a problem outside the index when the company's listed individually. And it gets a little bit exacerbated because the stock tends to go up in the index, right? That may be the case, uh, but over time, that typically that typically comes back, I think. And it still remains a problem, I and mean, it's the same problem in or in or out of the index, I think, uh, for the for shareholders. But if I can build on your question, I mean, the proposals we have now at Voting Rights are about excluding or weighting down companies from the index. And that's where uh, we are a little bit uncertain what would happen to those companies, who would own those companies, and what would, do to the, what would do that do to liquidity and price of those companies. So these are fairly big decisions, especially the flagship indices, the ones that major investors follow. If companies are excluded or weighted down in those indices, that could have, uh, could have ramifications for the whole market that we still don't really understand. So... That's why we also urge some caution in these proposals because there are consequences here that we don't fully understand yet. You, you, you produce so many indices. 
I wonder whether you would consider one more, and that is to have an Why index. Why not? And that is to have an index without either dual class shares or without shares where voting rights are extremely unequal. And let investors choose which one they want. Uh, it, it's that that it's that would avoid some of these issues. Some would go for they would want the index with SNAP, and some would not for various reasons. I mean, it seems to me choice is a maybe a better mechanism than either a, a statutory uh, constraint. Well, I guess the easy answer is to me to turn to the gentleman to my left and say, if they'd agree to license it, we'd definitely agree to start calculating it. The, 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 honest, answer, the honest answer is that he would do an index of baby Roos bars if we'd pay for it. <laughs> You're right, but if he would be high. We may do business no, here today. There, there is a certain amount of you know, business issues and that kind of thing, but I, I personally would, um, I, I'm very sympathetic to the, the suggestion and so on. Um, right now, I think that in terms of number of companies, the, um, the unequal voting, stocks would be a far fewer number, but I don't know the figures. And they'd have a clear industry concentration. It would be technology companies, media, company, media companies, and we know who, which ones are going to buy which other ones. And, and, some, and, that, and, right? some, and some biotech companies, because that's where they mostly resides. Lucian, you have the microphone in your hand. <laughs> yeah, just to follow up on what Julian just said and David said, I think the takeaway from the combination of the comments it's the hope that some people have that the index providers will step in and solve the problems that the legislatures are not solving it and the stock exchanges are solving. So there has been a sentiment here of wish that the legislature will do something or the exchanges, none of them is doing it, the exchanges are way to the bottom. Let's hope that the cavalry uh, are reflected by David and his colleagues from the uh, index industry, they will step in. We can't expect this to happen. Why? Because let's suppose that David chooses something and the site chooses something, and we don't have any of the standard indices have dual class structures. Then, as long as there is some demand, and we just heard somebody who said, I want to invest in the full investment market, then somebody will step in and provide this index. They will just say, Somebody's willing to pay for it, do it. Indeed, if this happened, then David would say, I have to have two S&P 500 indices. One with a star and one with two stars. One of them has the dual cut structure, one doesn't. So, in the end, one would, you can't really expect that the index uh, uh, providers will be able to substitute for what people were we hear the same. We hope that the legislature will do something. I guess I'll tell you a very short and true story. When shortly after SNAP started, uh, we had various people call up and say, we want to come talk to you, and rather aggressively. And they came in and met with us. Um, part, but not all of them, were from the Council of Institutional Investors, but I wouldn't want to you know, put them all in that category. And they gave a big pitch on why one share, one vote was the, should be the truth, and why the only thing standing between that and total disaster were the index providers. And our first suggestion was, look, we'll be happy to build your custom index. You tell us what kind of companies you want in it, and we'll do it. And the immediate answer is, no, 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 we don't want, nobody will know anything about that. You gotta put it in the S&P 500. And I'm sure when they went to MSCI it was an equivalent conversation, and FTSE an equivalent conversation. So that's, that's unfortunately the practicalities. The groups on both sides want to gain a little publicity and leverage from what somebody else does. And that's, you know, so that's why we're sort of trying to be neutral at this point um, without completely ignoring investors uh, and clients. And there's obviously a big overlap between them. So I think if there's um, any hope to have uh, some redress here, uh, it, it doesn't reside with the index providers, I agree. I hope not. It doesn't reside with the stock exchanges. 
but it, it, it may reside with some variety of either uh, institutional uh, regulators, governmental regulators, or the quasi-governmental regulators uh, who are around the world who have some influence. But it's a long road and a, not, not an easy one. I think the problem with, with creating, as, as Lucian's pointed out, you'd have the S&P 500 and the S&P 450, except that the 450 would be out all of those the, the, the really popular stocks wouldn't be there. They'd be in. They'd be out. And the likelihood of that product garnering enough uh, interest is pretty small. Now, um, I can tell you that um, you know there's, there's been the gun debate, right? That we've heard over the, over the past whatever number of months. Uh, we talked to many of our clients. Uh, some said, you know, don't take those guns out of the index. We want those gun manufacturers. They're, we're fine with that. What, why are you calling us to even discuss it at one extreme? At the other extreme, some said, you know, we never want to see another gun manufacturer again. Now, the gun manufacturers constitute less, like the airlines, as I told you before, even smaller, and they're, they're way under 1% of any index. Um, so we actually do offer a product today, which is an index without the gun manufacturers, and I think without one or more of the big retailers the gun retails, but I'm not sure of that. Um, I don't know how it's doing, but it is available uh, to anybody who wants to make that choice. Is that actually, a long-standing better example, um, S&P for many years has offered the S&P 500 excluding alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. And that's gained great popularity with various groups. The irony of it is for most many years, the best performing stock in the S&P 500 was Philip Morris, which obviously is major tobacco producer, now, now called Altria, but the same result. Um, and I guess the answer is, it may not fit morality, but if you own, if you're a monopolist in an addictive substance, it's a heck of a good business, and so on. But so it both way, works both ways. So can I just uh, ask, um, uh, take it from a slightly different angle. So Julian proposed to have two flavors that you offer to the market and then people can choose. And your answer essentially is that, you know, we sort of think morally, ethically, you know, one flavor is better than the other, but nobody wants to buy that. So that's Julian, it doesn't work. Okay, now, but what happens in cases where you engage with a company, like, you know, the company we don't want to mention, and since you have no voting rights, they say, well, thank you very much for engaging with us, stewardship, but we don't listen. What do you do then? Well, an active manager can sell. They say, okay, you're not listening. Goodbye. We're selling you. You can't really do that. Now, Jonas, uh, you are your own client. Uh, you've put a cross through gun manufacturers. I mean, is that, should you talk to the Ministry of Finance and should you have the liberty of putting a cross through some companies in your portfolio that don't listen to you, and you wouldn't even have to license uh, David to do that? I think I'll be very careful about improvising advice to the Ministry of Finance uh, here tonight, <laughs> but, uh, but in, 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 exactly, in the, on camera, uh, thank you. But uh, just to say very, very specific, generally, we, we take a, a broad index, and then there are certain companies which are excluded by an independent council of ethics, and this. tobacco is one of them. Um, and certain types of ammunition. Uh, but that's, that's an ethical consideration. Uh, we will also divest from companies where we think there is a, the, the risk is too high associated with uh, sustainability practices. So, so that, but that's an invest financial decision that we make uh, with these companies. When we, concerning voting rights, that's more a structural issue that, that uh, hasn't risen to that kind of level of, of financial risk. Um, and therefore would not be not something that either the would be excluded on an ethical ground or or even for for financial reasons i'd I'd like to just uh, push David just um, slightly on on a comment that you made earlier you you said that um, you know we're being neutral, but in fact, this is a moment when s and p as I understand it, has not gone neutral but said. No more multi-class uh, companies in the S&P 500. That's not neutral. And I would have argued that MSCI, if we don't know exactly what they'll come out with, but the proposal is also not neutral, nor is uh, the FTSE Russell. So my, I guess my question is, who does, who does an indexer work for? 
I mean, B BlackRock presumably is accounts for a lot of your your revenue, S and P, in in your case. I'm sure the others too. H how is it that you make these judgments? All right. Well, I guess I'm not sure we're neutral, but I think we step. We wanted to step back from being very much on one end of the thing, which I think was encouraging companies to do what Google did or what Snap did. But who do we work for? In a business sense, you know, where does the revenue come from? BlackRock is obviously a major client, as are BlackRock's direct competitors in issuing exchange-traded funds and various other elements of the financial services industry. But I would answer the question not very differently from what you did, and that every once in a while, certainly probably less than once a year, there comes up a question in something adjusting an index where you can really see there are going to be some people come out ahead and some people come out behind. Whether derivatives traders trading options on the index are going to benefit if we do it one way, and if we do it the other way, shareholders are going to benefit, or whatever it is. Not very often, but it happens. And my answer consistently has been, I think of somebody saving money for his or her retirement or put their kids to college, he's probably not a highly informed investor. She doesn't have a whole lot of experience. But they put this money in an ETF or a mutual fund that tracks the S&P 500. And they read all the literature that everybody produces, not just you and me, but the rest of the world. And they think this is relatively safe. And if I'm supposed to worry about anybody at the end of the day, that's who I think we're really working for. That's, that's obviously not where the revenue comes in and any of that kind of stuff. But you know, to the extent we're not, not just out there to make money and we're nasty people on Wall Street, that's who I think we should worry about everyone, every so often. Yeah. Uh, I wonder how much this debate uh, is uh, US and uh, Dow Jones related, because if I think of global investing, I see many structures uh, uh, that have limits to voting rights, that may be not just one share, one vote, but it may be like hierarchical structures that create a hierarchy of, uh, of voting rights. And so in a way, uh, Maybe this is the first time that the U.S. focus again on uh, this issue, but at the global level, uh, it's a well-known issue. Uh, in Switzerland, I think uh, it's not only non-voting shares, but it is multiple voting shares, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, I wonder whether so it's not not just taking out Google from the index, from the worldwide index, but it's taking out a lot more of that. So I think uh, whether the point is not, is simply one of standardization, i.e. within uh, given indexes, we are used to have uh, plain vanilla ownership structures without uh, separation of ownership from control, and that could be S&P, whereas in other indexes, we are more used uh, to generate an investable thing, uh, as large as possible investable uh, portfolio uh, to allow for diversification without uh, uh, restrictions. And a third possibility would be to create uh, another index uh, where you put all the companies that have some form of restrictions on, on voting rights, not only one share, one, vo one vote, but also the other ones to make this non-homogeneity more evident. Well, I, I don't think it's limited to the U.S. Um, S and P, because our the indices that make get the most press or make the most money happen to be U.S. We tend to be fairly U.S. centric, but it's certainly not limited to the U.S. Uh, and so on. The rules and the games vary around the world, I think. Um, Spotify, which uh, went public sometime earlier this year, uh, they said we, and is I believe a Swedish company, we, we treat it as a Swedish company, they said one vote, one share, but if you were one of the founding people, you also got a warrant attached to your share, it gave you another 20 votes. I couldn't figure out how that was different, 
how that would made them innocent or something like that. It sounded like a good gimmick to me. But that, so clearly it is not just U.S. And I think, first, I don't think this is going away. It's going to be with us for a long time. And I think it will begin to crop up in other countries over time. Um, a couple of months ago, I was in Toronto for an annual meeting we have with a lot of uh, major index investors up there. And at their request, we put this on the agenda for the meeting. Um, nobody wanted to change anything with the Canadian indices, but they definitely wanted to start thinking about it. So it, it, it's going to ripple around a lot of countries. So the uh, MSCI asked for <coughs> a, a, a consultation and offered the opportunity to, to put in a paper. Um, so MSCI is located in London. And we, uh, our, our response uh, on the very first page cites that in some markets, such as the UAE index, you'd lose 25% of the companies if, 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 you, if you restrict it, right? Uh, and we cite others. And we cite IOSCO as a possible source of at least, if not direct uh, regulation, uh, uh, as an indirect uh, uh, party that could actually have a lot of influence in doing this. So we, are, we don't think it's just a U.S phenomenon, um, but it is, but in truth, um, while the UAE index is, an, is, a, you know, is, is a very nice index, it's not the S&P 500, uh, and it doesn't threaten to become the S&P 500 soon, uh, so, and we're sitting in, in Cambridge, so it is, and ETFs are much more prominent here, index funds are much more prominent here than they are in Europe. Um, sovereign wealth funds do a lot of indexing, but the, but the retail investors, it's not as mature a market. But it will get there, and it's, and it's a fair question. But maybe I wasn't clear. I wasn't saying that it is, uh, that it, it's a debate on the one share one day, and then it is a U.S. Uh, uh, surprise, in the sense that elsewhere, the restrictions on voting rights are normal. Uh, yes, but... Uh, that's true, but uh, that doesn't mean that we, as a investment management firm, uh, don't think that you know that's got to, that ought to be in some fashion considered and talked about as well. But yes, it's, it may be more commonplace in other places in the U.S. But the second question was, uh, wouldn't it be good to tell apart, like follow the U.S. and uh, suggestion, not to group, to standardize, to create another index where all these. Uh, uh, so-called uh, restrictions on voting rights are evident so that uh, we know um, what are the all the sorts of restrictions, not just the one share, one vote. That, so uh, no so, so I can, I, I'm happy to talk to our uh, product people and ask whether they want to do that, but I, I'm, sure, I'm sure they're going to respond by saying, you mean I have to pay David for his index and MSCI and three other index providers, Russell, at FTSE Russell, to create the one index. Uh, my guess is that it's not a product that's likely to come to the fore. But yeah, I, Tell me I, I think part of it's just a question of whether we, all the information is readily available and we can do this, and the, and the laws and regulations vary from country to country to country, very much so. There are some spots where indices step into this, but the real problem is in the, an index by its nature is really supposed to be a mass, a mass custom product. It is not individual investing. It's not like you go to a firm and have a personal investment manager who chooses exactly what goes into your portfolio. This is, this is a mass consumer product, and it is by its nature, and that happens to be one reason why the fees, whether we get them or BlackRock gets them, are incredibly low when you think about what's going on. There are some places where the mass investing character holds and you can do specialty things. The largest example is, in fact, I suspect in the UAE, there'll be a Sharia screen version of that index. Absolutely. And no yeah, and there the economics works. But um, you know, to choose all the companies which have, you know, two share classes, but by the way, one of them sunsets after exactly five years, that's going to be a very small index, and I don't want to spend the money to figure out who they are. 
And, and the purpose is not not to own those companies, but the purpose of it, such an index would be to persuade those companies with unequal voting structures to uh, gradually abandon those or give shareholders more rights. So it's not about that we don't want to be involved in those companies. We do want to be involved in those companies, but we want to have a say in those companies. So that, that, that's more about the incentive structures that indices could or could not build into uh, their indices. Remember, we, we've been okay. talking about in, in indices as singular products, siloed products. You buy the S&P 500. In reality, there are people who do that, but there are also people who are using indices as an asset allocation tool, and they're buying an emerging markets index to get exposure there. They're buying the S&P 500. They're buying the FTSE 100, whatever it may be, to, to get themselves a portfolio which heretofore would have been accomplished by buying individual securities in all of those markets. So um, that, that is going on clearly uh, out there with investment advisory uh, firms. I okay. think we have time for one more question. From Thank there. you. Okay, my question is, I was very intrigued by what Matthew mentioned before of companies uh, not, meeting, not willing to meet you and basically not opening the door to you. Um, I have two questions. One... As with financial institutions, have you ever considered voluntarily disclosing, disclosing some of the actions that you do to govern companies? For example, how many, um, how many, uh, who you met, not just how many, who you met, who was not willing to meet with you, specific actions. And, and I'll, wait a second, and, and the second, I, I, yeah, I know you're laughing, okay. Um, and, and, a, and a second um, question related is, um, you know, before, Financial, financial institutions were required to disclose their votes. Basically, we didn't even know about, you know, we basically had no indicator about how financial in institutions govern the firms. Now we have that indicator. Do you think it would be good if the regulator required some kind of disclosure of the governance actions different um, institutions take so that investors have the opportunity to decide if they want to invest in a firm that does more governance versus less governance? So um, the, the, the balance and the tension between an open disclosure of who we meet with, when we meet with them, what we've discussed, uh, and the like, uh, sort of a, a, an equivalent of what the, you know, the federal government and many state governments are required to do if they ever meet with somebody, uh, has to be balanced against, uh, at least our view, that if we want to affect change, um, some private discussions and patience is often required. So that's a balance. It's not perfectly on one side or perfectly on the other. It's a balance. And as you probably all know, uh, or if you don't, I'm prepared to tell you, uh, when, when we voted on the Exxon um, Mobile climate change uh, proposal last year, we listed on our website the day we voted, not seven months later how we voted, and why. I equally importantly, we, we added a few paragraphs of why. So we're not going to do that for every vote, uh, but we, we will from time to time begin uh, and do that and continue to do it when we think it's, it's in the interests of investors to, to know. Uh, there's obviously a lot of interest in how does BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street vote. Um, trust me, our communications department gets those inquiries uh, on a daily basis. Uh, multiple times a day. But that's the balance. The balance is between how can we be most effective on behalf of our clients in, in trying to change corporate governance in places that we think need to be changed. So just uh, a tiny question, one more sentence. Do you think it would be effective just to disclose the companies that aren't willing to meet you, for example? This or, is I, sort of like Martin Luther posting the bans um, <laughs> that we, and shaming companies by saying uh, you won't meet with BlackRock. Um, I, I doubt that a company with zero vote in our hands will will uh, do anything except you know circle the wagons and defend themselves even more would be my guess. I would just add to that that the recent report by the European high level expert group on shareholder rights has made this argument that there should be more disclosure not necessarily uh, by name in which companies but that they they are uh, they have recommended to the European Commission that that kind of disclosure be, be made uh, mandatory for European-based institutions. Yeah. Okay, so I think we've come to the end of the first day of the GCGC. 
I think on the index question, we heard a very powerful paper from Japan uh, that showed uh, how what a powerful in influence in indices can be. Uh, my conclusion from the panel is, uh, or what from uh, I heard, is that at least S&P are willing to produce any index that the world <laughs> wants, <laughs> provided somebody pays for it. Um, now, then I heard from uh, Matt that you know who's you know, re working for people who actually have to sell uh, products that there's not much demand out there for Julian's index, uh, so it's going to be a difficult sell. Um, so I fear, Jonas, that the, the, the eyes of the world are turning to you, the, the Norwegian uh, uh, fund, um, because you can basically do what you want um, and you don't have any clients to answer to other than your Ministry of Finance and the Parliament of Norway. Um, you know, so maybe we just leave it at that. No, but, and I, but <laughs> I, I can just say in, in order to do that, we need more research on this important topic. So we're very happy okay. for the paper on the index That's in Japan. Good. And uh, we would like more research on how indices work, what the effects would be of including other measures than we have today. So, uh, Okay, you. so with this open really? invitation to the collected uh, room of scholars, uh, we have the next GCGC conference in Frankfurt next year. And we're looking forward to the paper that's going to solve the issue that we've been debating tonight. And for dinner, we have uh, the dinner speakers, Larry Summers, who's not exactly unknown to everybody. Um, and I understand he's going to talk for about 20 minutes. And we don't know what he's going to talk about. Uh, so um, dinner is at 7 o'clock. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. I should... Yeah, yeah. And sorry, so before we all go, I really want to thank um, David. Uh, and Matt uh, and Jonas. Uh, some of you have come from far, others have come from closer. Um, I think this was a great panel and the interaction between law scholars, finance scholars, economists and people uh, from the real world <laughs> uh, is very stimulating and I hope that our exchange is stimulated, as Jonas said, uh, new research on this important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for a very interesting day.